In this Part C lecture notebook for Module 2, we will be studying arrays of data. Specifically, we will look at how to index arrays of data, we will look at how to properly slice through arrays of data, and we will also see how to perform several useful operations on arrays of data. The notebook contents are fairly short. Uh, we have this part that's focusing mostly on the indexing of an array. There's a single embedded activity, and of course, then the summary activity that you're asked to do at the end of the notebook. We should always remember and keep in mind that Python indexing is zero based. This means that the first entry in a row or column is indexed by zero. That means that while you might mathematically refer to the 1, 1 component as the first component in the first row and first column of a two dimensional array, you must actually use 0, 0 with square brackets, note the use of the square brackets, to actually access that specific component within a 2D array. More generally, this means that the ij component of a two-dimensional array should be indexed as i minus one and j minus one. So while mathematically we use one indexing, we start counting at one, in the programming of Python, and this is also true in MATLAB and some other programming languages as well, we start at zero. And then you always need to subtract one then from the index just to be clear about what's going on with which component you're accessing. You should have that translation in your mind and it will become second nature. It might be awkward at first, but over time you get quite used to it. Another really interesting way to access components or certainly useful in some cases is using negative integers. So instead of, let's say, uh, if you have an array that has uh, a length n, you can use negative one instead of n minus one. And again, it's n minus one because of the indexing starting at zero to access it. You could also use negative two instead of n minus two to get the second to last entry and so on. So that's really useful when you want to produce the elements of array in a reverse order, which does come up in some programming and data science uh, you know, situations. So a visual aid that I have for you here is this 2D array, and this of course extends to 3D and 4D and other dimensional arrays naturally. But you can see in this first row and first column, you index with 0, 0. And then in the first row, second column, it's 0, 1. And then it's 0, 2 for the first row, third column, right? And then the second row, first column is 1, 0 third row, first column is two zero and so on. And then what I also point out in this visual aid is that the last row, if there's n rows, can be indexed either using n minus one or negative one as the first component entry. And then the this last column, for instance, can be accessed if there's m of the columns, m not n, then you can use an m minus one or a negative one. And of course that's in that second component. Now, I'm already showing some slicing here. If you just do a colon for one of the components that you're asking for, you're asking for all the components. So this is saying, give me all of the components in the second uh, entry there, which would be the columns. So this would give me an entire row. If I did n minus one co uh, colon or negative one colon, that would give me the last row and colon comma m minus one or colon comma negative one would give me that last column. Now, of course, that m and n, you can't use just m and n unless m and n are actually numbers that are defined with respect to the shape of this um, array. I'm assuming here n might be like 10 or eight, like if, so if there were 10 rows, that n would be 10, and here this would be nine colon or negative one colon would be the same thing. And if m, let's say, was seven, so there were seven columns, columns, then I would have colon six because of the seven minus one, or colon negative one would do the same thing. And then of course, if I had, let's say, two comma colon, that would give me the third row. If I had colon comma one, that would give me the second column. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind with that visual aid. You can hopefully start to make sense of that. So that's what that visual aid is, and then we'll start to see some examples. We now go over some examples using NumPy. So make sure to run this code cell to import NumPy as NP, which is the standard way in which we import NumPy. I'm gonna create a 2D array uh, and assign it uh, ARR underscore 2D, short for you know this 2D array name. And you'll see that it is three rows with two columns. You can follow the square brackets. This is something that was talked about in a previous lecture notebook. And it has one, two as the first row, three, four as the second, and five, six as the third row. 
I will print that entire array, and then I will show that the 1, 1 component, the mathematical component, so I'm using the notation kind of parentheses, i, j, as I was discussing in the text up here, this, this kind of mathematical notation, is indexed uh, according to the Python 0 indexing scheme using the square brackets with the array. Parentheses are reserved for functions. So we're using square brackets when we're indexing. That's very important. So this is going to give the 1-1 one, one component, the first row, first column, because it's 0-0. Zero, zero. The 0-1 zero, is going to report the first row, second column. This will give the second row, first column. And this will give us the third row, second column. All right, that's what that is. So that's the 3-2 component. And then notice I also do this uh, this negative indexing. So because that's three, right? So the that would go back to this um, this visual. N is three in this case, so N minus one is two, but I could also have the negative one. And you see that's exactly what I'm doing here. There's the two, there's negative one. So if I go ahead and I run this, you'll see exactly what's going on. So there's my 2D array, one, two, three, four, five, six as the rows. And then you can see that the 1, 1 component, mathematically 1, 1 component, is given by that 0, 0 indexing, and it's given by the 1. And then you can just follow through and see that everything made sense. There's an error that will come if I uncomment this line here. I'm asking you to try and comment in the next line to see an error. Can you explain it? You might want to pause this video and try that for yourself. Okay, or now you can watch me. So I uncomment that uh, line, and now I run this, and you will see an error. And notice it's an index error. And it's saying index two is out of bounds for axis one with size two. So what does that mean, the axis one? Well, as we'll see, this is actually in, in a, a visual aid that's provided lower in the notebook. So I'm just gonna scroll down real quick to find it. Axis zero refers to the rows and axis one refers to the columns. So if we come back up here and we look at this error, it's saying the error is with axis one. So it's basically saying you have an error with how you're trying to index the columns. And you can see that what we're asking for is the third column. Well, this was an array that did not have three columns. It had three rows and two columns. And so that's what's going on with this index error. So I'm just gonna go ahead and comment that back out, but I just wanna give you a sense of what types of errors you can see if you try to index an array incorrectly and how to make sense of reading the error messages. So I'll just go ahead and rerun that and then there's no output because everything's commented out. Now here's a new array that's shown here. This is a 3D array and I'm creating two, let's see what they are. I'm creating two two by three arrays. So this should have, let's just go ahead and run this. So there's the first, 2D array, there's the second 2D array in my 3D array, uh, which is just a collection of 2D arrays. And I see the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 as the two two-dimensional arrays stored in my 3D array. It's an array of arrays. That's a good way to think of that 3D array. And so now I'm showing, for instance, that the 1, 1, 1 component, which would be, again, this one here is basically saying like the first 2D array, and then what is the one one component in it and that should be one right there and you can see it is one and then when i ask for the one one two i'm saying that first 2d array the first row and the second column so that's given by zero zero one and you can look at that and say that should be given by two in the index scene that's exactly what i just went over here zero zero one and oops um just kind of move my screen around a little bit and there you go, there's the, the thing of two. Now I, again, recommend, this is a great place in a video where I really recommend adding scratch cells, adding your own code cells, play with this. Look at, if you pick a component here, like pick the number 10, pick the number eight, pick the number five, 12, and just say, could I give you exactly the index set of indices that you need to access that. You should be able to do that for yourself. Really play around with it and make sure that you can get the particular component you want using this indexing correctly. Do it for the 3D array and do it for the 2D array. Because I didn't do all of them. You should try to do it for yourself. Just fill them out. It's really going to make sure for yourself that you understand what's going on. And now here's another 2D array. Uh, and this will conclude this part of the video before the, the remaining part of the video. This is a it still has the one, two, three, four, five, six that we saw above. So we have that one, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm just recreating this um, array just in case you changed it. So it's really the same array. Um, you don't necessarily need to redefine it because I didn't change anything about that array. 
But now I'm going to show you how to do some slicing. So the colon all by itself will give you all of the entries for the row or column in which that colon appears. So here, this should give me the first row, zero comma colon. If you don't use the colon at all, you will still get the same info out. I highly uh, dissuade you. I don't want to discourage you from doing that. I think this makes the code a little unreadable, like it's not clear what you're doing there. Um, so this is not a preferred way to do it, although it will give you the same answer. Of course, you can't do that if you're working with the first column. You need to have the colon and then the zero. But you can access the rows by just putting a zero, a one, or a two, because this is this has three rows, and you can do comma colon or just nothing. But then I think that just makes the code look very non-standard. People don't typically do it this way. But I do want to show you there are other ways you can do this, and maybe you'll have a need or a desire to do it this way at some point. Please don't do that in this class, though. Let's just go ahead and run it and show you how the array slicing works. And so you can see again, it's one, two, one, two. That's the first row. Again, Python indexing is at zero. And then the first column is one, three, five. And if you see the output of it, it's not presented in a vertical fashion. It's presented in this one dimensional array fashion. So that's kind of it for that part of the um, slicing. We're going to get into some more advanced array slicing next. We now discuss some more advanced array slicing. We use the colon operator. Now before, what we saw is just the colon operator by itself, along with specifying a row or a column in order to give the entire row or column. However, you can provide integers, i and j, on the left and right of the colon operator in order to specify a range of values to take from a row, a column, or in, you know, a little bit more complex uh, depending on where you position it inside of like a 3D or higher dimensional array. But the tricky thing is, and this definitely gets students a little tripped up when they're first learning this, is that i colon j is interpreted as starting at the integer i up to, but not including j. And I repeat this, you should also think of this as being interpreted as all entries starting at i up to, but not including j, meaning that i colon j is interpreted as, again, all entries starting at i up to but not including j. And before we forget, you should also think of i colon j being interpreted as all entries starting at i up to but not including j. And my quiz to you is, how should you think of i colon j? Let's go ahead and look at an example of this. So I'm going to take a, I'm going to use the range, just like we've seen how we can make a list uh, using the range operator. You can also make arrays very quickly, an array of integers out of this. Um, and so you, you could also uh, make an array of floats if you like. But I'm going to do a range from 1 to 13, which means it's actually going to go 1 up to, but not including 13. So it's going to produce 12 integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I'm asking to reshape that as a 3 by 4 array, right? So like a 2D array, a matrix. So I'm now going to print that entire matrix. And I'm going to show you how I can use the colon by itself, which this should produce all the rows. And this is one up to, but not including three. So this should, now again, Python indexing is at zero. So that one means start at column two, go up to, but not including column four. Again, Python indexing starts at zero. So that one is really referring to the second column. If I wanted to start at the first column, I would have to do zero there. So or just nothing, nothing is a substitute for zero to the left of the colon, but it's always a good idea to be explicit. So one colon three is saying, I want columns one and two in terms of the indexing, which is really the second and third columns, but I don't want the fourth column corresponding to the index three. That one won't be included. So let's go ahead and run this just to see. So there's your full matrix, one, two, three, four is the first row, five, six, seven, eight is the second, nine, 10, 11, 12. So with this particular slicing where I say, give me all the rows. So I want all three rows, but I only want the second, the second because of the Python indexing starts at zero, the second and the third columns, the output of that should be two, three, six, seven, and 10, 11 organized as three rows. And we see that's exactly what it gives. You should play around with this. Again, I'm just giving some examples. Make your own until it kind of drives home what all these things mean and how you can manipulate and access the array contents that you want with slicing. I show some other ways in which you can use um, a list of array, a list of indices in order to assign new arrays based on the outputs of 
what a sliced array is. So here, what do you think B should be? I'm taking A and I'm saying, what I want to do is I want to give it the first, right? That's the zero here. And I also want to give it the last, because I'm using the negative indices, row. So I'm using the first and the last row. And then I say, give me all the columns for that. That's what B should be. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and change this so that this is print B. And I don't know why that has a space there. That's a superfluous space. So I'll get, I'll get rid of that. And then for C, I want to take all the entries of B that are, excuse me, all the rows. And then I want what? I want the second and third columns of B, right? And so B should have four columns because it took all of the columns of A, but it only took the first and the last rows of A, the zero and the negative one there. So B should look like one, two, three, four is the first row, and it should look at nine, 10, 11, 12 as the second row. And that should be it, and it right, has all the columns. And then for B, I want the middle two of the columns of it. I want the second and the third columns, and that should be what C is. So C should be two, three, 10, 11. This is a good part. If you were having a hard time following along with that, try to rewatch this or pause this. Look at this again. Try to write it down on a piece of paper. See what you think it should be. Run this code for yourself. Change these numbers around. You can even swap the orders of these so that B has the last row of A first. If you make that negative one and you make this zero, play around with that. Like you should really play around with this because it's a really convenient way to start thinking about how you might manipulate these things. Because the idea of having to extract out certain rows or columns out of arrays of data comes up all the time in computational and data science. So it's really a technique you want to get used to, even if this seems like a really kind of silly toy problem to play with. But let's go ahead and just run this just to make sure I was not speaking nonsense. And we see one, two, three, four as the first row, nine, 10, 11, 12 as the second row of B. I said B had two rows. It should be the first and the last row of A and all the columns, that's exactly what it is. And then C should have um, all the rows of B, but only uh, the middle two columns, the second and the third column. So it should have that 2, 3, 10, 11, and that's exactly what it has there. So there you go. That's how you can do some more sophisticated array slicing. But again, you should make your own examples. Really explore this to make sure that you understand it and that you're producing the examples that are producing the output that you're anticipating. Good thing for you to do. A good thing to realize is just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. So you can omit a later index uh, when you're doing the array slicing. So for instance, if you have a multi-dimensional array, say A is a two-dimensional array of shape three by four, then you can use A zero colon two or zero colon two comma either way to perform the slicing, assuming that you want to have the entire first and second row. So you're saying, I want the first and second row. Are you asking for all the columns that are in the rows? Because right now what you've done with zero colon two or zero colon two comma is you're not specifying anything for the columns. So you're just expecting that it will give you all that information, all those columns. So, you know, if you can do it with less typing, why not? You know, why do you have to type comma colon to get all of the columns that you want? So you could do that. If multiple rows and columns are being sliced, this will generally give you the result that you expect. However, if you're just after a single row or column being sliced, things can definitely go a bit awry and unexpected results may ruin your code as we'll show in some examples. And so a real key takeaway is this, um, it is best to be explicit about what you want in your code and use shortcuts in your code very carefully and very deliberately because it is very easy to get strange results when you are being just maybe a bit too clever or slick in writing code. Other people could use your code and then get really weird results or you just may forget why you were doing something. So as an example, let's go back to this array A that was being created up above here. So this is the three by four array matrix. And I'm gonna just show you the different slicing. So there's the zero com, uh, colon two, zero colon two comma, zero colon two comma colon. And now I'm showing you, well, look what happens when I subtract, you know, th these two arrays. This should give zero. This should be exact, because I'm just based an array of zeros because everything matched up. That's exactly what happens here. All of these just produced, uh, so it's zero colon two. So remember zero colon two is going from the first row up to, but not including the third row, which is again indexed by two. 
So this is the first and second rows. That's what I'm doing with zero colon two. And you can see, okay, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can see that this is what's happening where I slice everything. It looks great. Everything worked. You say, well, so why should I do this right here? Why should I ever do that comma colon? Okay, let's look at how stuff might appear here. So A, just zero. That's the first row, right? That's basically saying, just give me the first row. It's not zero colon anything. It's just the first row. Here's zero comma. Here is zero and I'm slicing up. I'm going zero colon one, which is starting at zero going up to, but not including the second row. And then I'm also having this comma colon here. Now, what happens when I subtract these two things? Notice that this is a 1D array. This is a 1D array, but that zero uh, colon one, that's producing a 2D array. Notice the two sets of square brackets there. So now, when I subtract these things, you say, oh, well, I'm getting a 2D array and it's all zero. So maybe there's no harm, no foul. This is producing results that maybe are, are fine. Everything zeros is what you want to have happen. But you did get, you did compare and to take the difference of two arrays that were of fundamentally different shapes. One was a 1D array, one was a 2D array. It just happened to work out here. If you slice individual columns, however, you can get, it's far more likely you can get strange results if you're not careful. So here I'm doing co colon, uh, comma, one, colon, comma, one, uh, and I'm looking at its shape. Now I'm doing, excuse me, <laughs> colon, saying colon and comma over and over, it can get a little tricky, my apologies. Uh, colon, comma, one, colon, two, right? So one up to, but not including two. So it's like, that should be, still just be the second column. Right, all the ones here are corresponding to the second column. And now you might expect, well, okay, this is maybe gonna look like a 1D array and this is gonna look like a 2D array. And what happens when we subtract them? Like nothing bad was happening up here. What happens down here? So there's your 1D array, 2, 6, 10. That is, of course, looking back at A. Let's just go up and look at it. So here we go. Here's that second column of A, 2, 6, 10. So we see down here, we have 2, 6, 10, and it's a 1D array when we sliced it that way. But when we did 1, colon 2, of course, we got a 2D array. We were expecting that. We saw this above with the, uh, with the row, so it's 2, 6, 10. But it's, notice this is organized now vertically, different than this. It has a different orientation. The orientation here was the same. It was basically a 2D array, but it was just a row. This is a 1D array, it's, so it's presented kind of just like a row, and this is definitely produced like a column, and it's a shape three by one. And when we subtract them, we're not getting just one a 1D array or even a 2D array with just three entries. We have a three by three array, which doesn't look like the shapes of either of these things, and you see that this pattern of 0, 4, 8, negative 4, 0, 4, and negative 8, negative 4, and 0 for all the entries. You have to ask yourself, how did that happen? What was it doing in this operation? Well, we were just weren't being careful. If you were, if you were doing this and expecting it to give the same result as here, this is why you need to be careful. You should be deliberate and explicit with what you're doing in the code, because if not, you can get some perhaps very strange results because maybe you weren't expecting that. You know, when I was first learning Python, I certainly wasn't expecting that. So again, be explicit in your code really think about what you're trying to do and make sure that you're taking differences of things as you're expecting them to, to work out because that you understand what the shapes are and how you slice through things is determining the shapes. And so then I have some additional uh, information here about re-examining single column slicing. So if you just look at the execution of the previous code cell, this is what you see in terms of if we want to use slicing of a 2D array of shape N by M to extract the jth column and keep the shape as if it's a column vector of shape n by one, then you should slice the original array using j minus one comma colon, excuse me, j. That's how you're gonna get it to be a shape n by one. And you, if you want it to be a shape one by m, if you're slicing the, um, the row, then you want to slice like this, right? You wanna basically slice this way instead of just giving it a number. If you want one row or one column, but you want it to be of the same kind of 2D array as the original array, even though the shape is changing because there's a different number of components, but you still want it to be a 2D array, you need to do the slicing, you know, where you put the number you want, the actual, the actual number, 
and you just do up to the next number because it doesn't include it, but that just makes sure the shape is what you want it to be if you want it to be still a 2D array. So that's just an important takeaway from what we have there. So that's it for this part of the video. If you want to slice from the end of an array, then you can use negative indexing. So you can use the negative in uh, slice allows you to access entries from the, va the last valid index. So for instance, if you use a negative one in a slice, it will select the very last entry in the array. And so if you wanted to, let's say, use, um, like you wanted to start at the third entry, let's say, and go up to, but not including the last entry, you would do two colon negative one, because it's gonna go up to, but not including the very last component. You, if you wanted that last component to be included, that last row or column, whatever you were doing with the slicing, and you say, I want to go from the third entry all the way to the last, including the last, just do two colon and then nothing. And if you want all the components, just do a colon. That's it. And so I have an example here, but this is, I think we're just rehashing what we've seen before. So you can run this and look at the outputs and make sense of it. And I, as something I've already shown is you can give arrays or list as inputs to specify specific rows and columns to also slice. And that's something we saw above when I was looking at the B and the C that were being defined uh, right here. So we've kind of already gone over that. So I just wanted to reemphasize that point down here as well, is arrays and lists of integers can be used to do some slicing as well. A very important thing for us to understand when we're manipulating arrays is how to actually do some element-wise and standard arithmetic with the arrays. Matrix algebra is not a significant portion of this course, but it is worth familiarizing yourself with it as it is the foundation of much of scientific uh, computing and data science. You do not need to know linear algebra in order to understand how to do basic arithmetic operations with matrices. It just requires a bit of practice. I provided a link for you to the wiki page. It's pretty straightforward. If you're given two arrays, uh, two matrices of the same shape, then you can add them together component-wise. It's pretty straightforward. You just, the first, each of the components in their positions get added together. You multiply a scalar to an array, you just multiply that scalar to every component. And the transposition, also called the transpose of, uh, of a multidimensional array, is just swapping the rows and the columns. So the first row becomes the first column of the transpose, the second row becomes the second column of the transpose, and so on. Matrix multiplication is a little more tricky. When you look at multiplying the two matrices together, if you're actually thinking of it in terms of matrix vector, matrix, matrix multiplication in a really standard way, then you need to have some compatibility conditions on the shapes of these uh, matrices. What you need is what we say are the inner dimensions to agree. If I want to multiply A to B, and A is M by N, then B it needs to be N by P. What is P and what is M? That doesn't matter. All that, all that determines is what the shape of the end result is. The end result will be M by P. And then what you have to figure out is, well, how do I actually figure out what the components are of the M by P matrix? Well, you are gonna take each row of A if you're multiplying A by to B, and you're gonna multiply it in order. Like you can't necessarily change the order and expect this to make sense. Um, you're gonna take each row of A and then multiply it to each column of B, and then which row and which column you multiply together in terms of the components and then adding them up, that's, that's what this operation is showing here, is you're multiplying the row of A to the, the column of B and you're, then you're adding up all the results. If when you put that all together, that becomes a specific component, the ij component, the ith row of A multiplied to the jth column of B becomes the ijth component of the m by p matrix that is the result. If m and p are different numbers, you can't trans you can't necessarily switch the order. B times A may not be something you can compute unless p is equal to m. And even if you can switch the order of multiplication in terms of it's something that at least is an allowable operation, you shouldn't expect the result to be the same. The order matters. It's not what we say is commutative. It's not like when you multiply three times four and four times three and the answer is 12 either way. You could take a two by two matrix and a two by two matrix, A and B both let's say are two by two. And if you switch the order of multiplication because it's defined either way, you can get completely different results at the end, even though the outputs are still two by two matrices in either case. 
this, this seems more tricky than it is. It just takes a little practice. They have some pictures here to kind of explain how to do this. And I believe they also show some examples of how A times B is not equal to B times A. And look at that, they're two by two matrix examples. And this is really good. If you've never worked this out before, spend 30 minutes here on this part of the Wikipedia page and work these things through with pencil and paper. I highly recommend it. It's gonna pay huge dividends later on. So back to this. NumPy has functions for both element-wise multiplication of arrays of the same matrix and standard matrix 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 vector multiplication. Where that means the inner dimensions have to agree. Arrays are really just matrices and vectors that are, or excuse me, arrays are basically just matrices and vectors are just special types of matrices. Two arrays can be added together if they are the same shape. The result is an array of the same shape with each component equal to the sum of the corresponding components. The np.multiply function does element-wise multiplication. So this is where you can take like a three by seven, excuse me, and a three by seven array. They have to be the same shape and you can multiply them together. Not like I was just describing, not matrix vector multiplication. You would just do it component-wise, the same way you do addition. So it, it's not a standard type of operation in linear algebra, but it is sometimes useful. And we see some examples of this below. np dot you spell out the word dot is really what you want to use for the matrix matrix or matrix vector multiplication kind of the standard type of multiplication that occurs from scientific computations involving linear algebra it, in at least finite dimensional linear algebra with matrices and vectors so this definitely requires the compatibility of certain parts of the shape the inner dimensions and the order matters this is what we were just talking about the element wise operations are kind of their own beast so we'll see examples of this below but we're not really going to dwell on this so again, array multiplication is not matrix multiplication. It is an element-wise operation. So here I'm asking, you know, one thing I left this blank, you should look at what this is creating. Like actually edit this uh, code comment here. What is C gonna be? Because A and B are going to use this range 113, which means one to 12 are the first integers generated by that range. And I'm gonna rearrange them as a three by four, a four by three array separately for A and B. And then C is gonna be one to 16, right, including 16. So one up to, but not including 17. And I'm gonna rearrange those integers as a four by four uh, array. And so that's something you can definitely just edit this comment just to show you're following along for yourself. If this creates a four by four array with the first 16 integers in it, and there you go. These are what the outputs are. Now I can do np.multiply to just do element wise multiplication. It's certainly shorter just to use the asterisk as, a, as an element wise operation. And right, that shouldn't be something I can actually do. That's not the matrix matrix multiplication because if A is a three by four and I multiply it to A and I was thinking of it as this matrix math, right? I need these inner dimensions to agree. I need the same number of components in the row as the same, or excuse me, the same number of columns as the same number of rows here for the second one. Otherwise I'm trying to multiply, you know, an, a different number of terms here to a different number of terms here. Like how do you multiply them if there's not the same number of terms? Um, so I shouldn't be able to do that with np dot dot, but np dot multiply is just element wise. So this is just the first, this is just multiplying each component to itself. Same thing as a times a and C plus C is also element wise addition. So you can actually guess what this is. If you think of multiplying a to a using element wise multiplication in either of these ways, you can just look at each of these components. You're just saying, oh, you're multiplying them to themselves. So it should be one, and then there should be four, nine, 16, 25, 36, and so on, right? This component here, 12 squared is 144. And C plus C, that should be just the components of C added to themselves. So this is one plus one is two, that should be four, this should be six, eight, and so on. So let's just go ahead and run this and verify that that is the output. So there you go. There's the squares of all the components because they're just getting multiplied to themselves. And here's two times each component because they got added to themselves. That's the element wise uh, multiplication and addition. Now I can take the dot product, so to speak, of A and B and B and A because A is a three by four and B is a four by three. So their inner dimensions agree. Right, there's four columns here and four rows here. So when you multiply each row of A, which has four entries to each column of B, which has four entries, there's the same number of things there. So I can multiply them each component by component, add up those results, and then that will be a certain component of the resulting matrix, which will be 
three by three because of the outer dimensions. And then similarly, I can multiply B to A using this dot function. And because there's each row of B has three entries, each column of A has three entries because there's three rows, and the resulting matrix should be four by four. So these should be very different matrices, and you can see that. Here's your three by three matrix. Here's your four by four matrix that came from that. And that leads us to the activity where I'm just asking you to experiment with some of this. There are some other NumPy functions and sub-packages you should be aware of, such as MATLAB, LinAlg, Random. I give you a link to a great reference here. Um, the page on n-dimensional arrays is also very useful. I really recommend taking 30 minutes to an hour. Just start surfing through some of this documentation and see what's available. What's really useful are some of the methods that can be applied in one line of code where the order of operation is specified by the order in which the methods appear from left to right. So I show some examples of this uh, below. I mean, we get we get to more of it lower, uh, below this. But I'm going to look at this matrix A that we we're dealing with above here. And I'm going to say, what's the mean of A? So it's the mean of all the components, the average value. But A is also a NumPy object, so it has this method attached to it. You can do using the dot convention a dot mean and because it's a function you have to use parentheses even if you're not passing any arguments you still have to use parentheses for it to properly work you can take the transpose of a which will interchange the rows and the columns as we talked but instead of doing np.transpose you could also do a dot transpose you could do np.max or you could do a dot max and again use those uh, parentheses to access it and so you can just run that out. i sorry just kind of jumped there you can examine these outputs, but play around with it. See more of what it is. You can look at the autocomplete feature, look at some of the um, options you have, make your own examples, really play around with this and see what's going on. And the last part of this video, we're gonna talk about how to think in terms of axes. So we say that the rows are aligned with axis zero and the columns are aligned with axis one. If you have a 3D array, the third dimension is aligned with axis two. And you can just imagine because this is Python indexing starts at zero. If you had a 10 dimensional array, then the 10th dimension is axis nine. Um, we sometimes only want to apply a function across rows or columns. So it is common to arrange a set of samples as an array where each row defines a single sample and the columns define the various quantitative entries associated with this sample. This happens all the time in computational and data science. So you could imagine that you have, let's say, sample one, sample two, sample three, and you have, let's say, M samples or N samples. The number doesn't really matter here. And you would organize these as the rows. And then the features of these samples, like if this was patient data, let's say like health data, uh, you might imagine that along the columns, you might say, oh, well, this is maybe their resting heart rate, and then this is their blood pressure and height and weight, and you would organize all of that across all the columns. If it was all the same data, you might want to know something like, what is, uh, you know, maybe it's like you measure, like, let's say this is tracking the height of, the, of, of children, that these were various children, you're measuring their height at various years. So it's height at year one, height at year two, year three, and so on. And then you want to know, like, what was the average height across all the times I measured it? then you only want to take the mean across axis one because you want to take the, you know, even though it's a, for each of the rows, your mean is being computed across each row, across the columns, excuse me, I should say. So it's really across these columns, it's across axis one. If I wanted to actually look at, oh, well, in year two, what was the average height of all the children being considered? I need to take the mean across axis zero in that case. You know, and, and then provide some slicing, like, you know, take this whole array and do like, uh, take the mean of this array in using axis, if I said axis zero, that would be across each of these. And if I took the second, uh, if, I, if I gave it a one as the component, that would give me the second column, let's say. So it's just something to really think about. You should read with, with it, or excuse me, read this, look at this uh, visual aid and then practice with this a little bit. So here I'm taking, for instance, like the mean of A with axis one, or, or A dot mean with axis one, A dot mean with axis zero, and this is that same matrix A as before, so it's that one through 12. And you can see if it's axis one, notice how I have three entries because there are three rows. And so you see that 2.5 is the first one. You can see at one, two, three, four, you can kind of visually see this. The mean value is, actually between two and three here because it's the way this data is ordered and symmetric around the mean in each um, row. So 
that's the mean in the first row, the mean in the second row is 6.5, the mean in the third row is 10.5. So you see that 2.5, 6.5, 10.5, and that came from axis being one. Yet when axis is zero, right, now you see five, six, seven, eight. There's four values, right, because there's four columns, and the mean of the first column is five. The mean of the second column is six, the mean of the third column is seven, the mean of the fourth column is eight. This happens to be the middle value in that case. And then you can do some things like take the transpose, which remember interchanges the rows and the columns, and then take the mean. Here, this takes the transpose again and takes the mean axis zero versus axis one. And so when you do it with this notation, like a dot transpose and then mean, I think this reads really nicely because you can do, okay, the transpose happens first, then I take the mean. If you were doing this with the functions, you would do np dot mean of np dot transpose and then you would have the axis only. Try to write that. That's a good exercise for you to do. How would you compute these last two results if you used np.transpose and np.mean instead of writing it like this? That's a really good little mini exercise for you. Create your own code cell. Try that. I really recommend that. That's the end of this video. Um, I just want to describe some things involving the axes, and then you have your summary activity. Don't forget to do it. Don't forget to make sure that your examples are well aligned with your summary points. That's it. Thanks for listening.